What was something poignant um, that stood out to the two of you um, in Charlottesville? Hmm. Well, I mean, I know I had, I had definitely had a couple. Um, <clears throat> I think after the after the service on Friday night um, at the, I believe it was the Episcopal Church, when we got ready to leave and we were put on lockdown mm -hmm. because the uh, all we heard was they were a bunch of white supremacists holding torches outside, like circling the campus and heading towards the church. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize how spoiled I was <laughs> in life, you know. Um, you hear about, you know, Nazis and you hear about KKK and you hear about people heading over, but you don't really realize the proximity and the vulnerability, you know, and being under siege like whether it's in a bomb shelter or having to hide out from a fire or having to hide out from something. The closest I had ever been was maybe a hurricane warning, you know. Um, and then just saying that there were people there on purpose and not really knowing what their intentions were, but knowing that it was legal <laughs> for them to be there. Um, and so I really did not know what to expect, you know. And I know that there was a very mixed population in that building, you know. And um, my friend, uh, Reverend Stephen Martin from the National Council of Churches, he's like, hey, Sahar, I'm your bestie. You know, you gotta, you gotta hop in my car and drive me. Uh, and I gotta drive you to the, where you're parking, your car is parked. So we went, I took off my hijab, and uh, he dropped me off where my car was parked. And um, he watched me get into the car, and you know, I thanked him, of course. And then it was time for me to leave the parking garage or the parking spot <clears throat> and then the young men who were the attendants I think that they really didn't know what was going on because they were a little bit isolated and then I pulled out my credit card and he said oh. I, I pulled out my credit card and the young man said we don't take credit cards we only accept cash or check and I said oh I said I mean I was really I said I don't have cash and then I said um and I looked for my wallet again, and then he says, you know, there's an ATM two blocks away. And then I said, um, and then I was just like, I just did not know what to say. You know, I said, can you just keep my credit card and I'll come back and, you know. And then he, he saw what I was wearing and he saw the hijab in my hand. And then he said, you know what, why don't you just go? <laughs> and he said, you know, he goes, you have the best excuse out of anyone. And I said, no, no. He goes, you know what, if you ever come back, if you ever do, just give us a little extra donation to the KN, you know. And then on Sunday, um, I think you were with me <laughs> when we, we had breakfast, yeah. And so then I s s went back to that parking lot and I gave the young man that was there 20. And he was like, what's this for? <laughs> and I said, I just told him the whole story. And then, and then he just kind of smiled and he goes, I hope you, you keep that scarf on. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll put it back on. <laughs> And I just, they were so gracious, the town of Charlottesville, so gracious, you know. Um, and then another one for me was <clears throat> when we were in the park, there were a lot of right-wing organizers that were there to organize, you know, that were there to do work, you know, and they were, they were definitely hijacked by, as a Muslim, there are a couple words that I, I use as syn synonyms because they're ingrained, you know, they're, they're, their meeting or their community was definitely hijacked by this group of terrorists or extremists. You know, so a lot of people like the constitutionalists and the patriots and the highwaymen that are have right wing ideologies but are not necessarily in cahoots with the terrorists and the KKKers um, <clears throat> were, were very upset that this group of young kids, you know, who are obviously in a lot of pain coming in and just, you know, uh, so I saw that difference in that community and how both sides were really in a lot of pain. You know, the one side was like, how could you guys do this? Everybody's calling us bigots and racists because of you and blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, well, now you know how I feel. We have a couple people that act like, you know, and so, so they were, they were feeling that I was feeling that ecumenical dichotomy difference, you know, within them. And then I just felt really bad for these young kids that were brainwashed, you know, because first of all, if it would have been, you know, 6,000 young men of color who wanted to convene with, you know, weapons, AK-40s, first of all, they would have never gotten a permit, <laughs> you know, to do it legally 
Or if like say 6,000 Muslims wanted to get together for an Eid picnic, oh and by the way, we're all gonna carry tiki torches with lights, you know, there would have been tanks and we would have been inspected. It wouldn't have been legal or, you know, um, so just the blatant um, double standard right there. But the fact that these, these kids and these gentlemen were really go chanting, you cannot replace us, you know, or blood and soil, I mean, that was, that speaks volumes. I mean, that just speaks volumes. That's like, that's something like a three-year-old says when his baby brother comes home from the hospital, a newborn, you know, and they were trying to engage with us. They're like, you don't understand, you call it the rebel flag, and it's, it's not a rebel flag, it's our history. Our great-grandfathers died in the Confederacy, and, you know, and, and um, you know, he, he, he felt that he was betrayed by the, by the Union, and he was, Robert E. Lee graduated from West Point, and he thought he was doing the right thing. He felt he was fleeing an oppressive regime, and he did it for the Union, and he did it for your right for religion, and he did it for this. So they were willing to engage, you know, some of them, you know, in their way. And, um, and then uh, behind us, we would hear uh, racists and bigots and this and that. And there was, nobody was listening to each other. Everybody was just sort of like talking at each other. Um, so for me, that was really hard to see. Because, uh, you know, I think I've heard um, all negative behavior is a result of unresolved pain. You know, so I don't think there were any winners that weekend at all. Any winners. And then I think what was really hard was when they finally, the police finally showed up after three hours. They let everybody out of the park. They closed down the action, you know, and there was no supervision. Everybody flooded into the streets. And that's when every, that's when the accident happened or the tragedy happened where the young man just bulldozed into the crowd. And the head, one of the um, clergy leaders, may God bless him, Reverend Seth comes in to where all the clergy were meeting in this coffee shop. And he said, a car has run into a group and there are, there are, you know, injuries. And they asked us all to come out. And still, I hadn't seen any ambulance yet. That's my first time witnessing a catastrophe. You know, and you can just see people piled around the injured. Finally, you could hear ambulance, you know, but it was so chaotic that even protesting medics, you know, medics for the protesters were treating Nazis that had, <laughs> had been injured. So it shows you the chaos of the day. You know, it shows you the chaos of the day. And uh, I just was thinking about, wow, like, God help the people that face, you know, car bombings in Iraq, like at ice cream stores in Ramadan, or um, the white helmets that that's dig up for babies after a bombing the morning after. You know, and that was just a tiny slice of reality for me. And it was two hours away in Charlottesville. And Charlottesville, we were talking about it, is such a unique hub when you think about it. Thomas Jefferson had five African-American children. You know, he had a relationship with an African-American woman. Thomas Jefferson also, there's a book on him in the Quran. You know, he actually was the first president to hold an iftar, a Ramadan iftar in the White House for the Tunisian um, ambassador. You know, and um, Congressman Keith Ellison swore on the Quran when he took office, the first ever Muslim American congressman. So it's actually kind of neat that this happened right on his campus, like so many, so much synergy. Um, so there are a lot of interesting moments for me. How about you, Max? What do, what do you notice? Um, my note of poignancy is kind of an arc. Um, there were scary moments on Friday when there was the lockdown at the St. Paul's. Memorial Church, as you mentioned, because there was the torch parade outside, and already pepper spraying had begun of people exiting the church. So the church goes into lockdown mode. Boy, I had just arrived at 9.45. This was happening at around 10. But we pull ourselves together, and when the coast is clear, they release us and tell us, don't go to the rotunda. Get out of here. That's what we did. We could see them in the distance, but we, we didn't go in their direction. And then, so we regroup, we pull together for the sunrise service at the first Baptist church on Main Street. And it was glorious. I arrived around 
right at six o'clock. The place was packed. I probably took the last seat. Um, there was inspiring song by the Reverend Seku. There was a great sermon by Dr. Cornell West. The whole thing was presided over by Deacon Don Gaithers, who was also the chair of the Blue Ribbon Commission, which led to all of these measures. So we're feeling strong again, and we're united on a, on a message of, of nonviolence. Um, we break into two units. One will do direct action at Emancipation Park, and the other will march through the city, bringing a message of nonviolence. Um, I, I join the Long March. We eventually go to another church, First United Methodist Church, which was very close to Emancipation Park and serving as a kind of sanctuary as well, with a medic station and other other provisions. And that's when I see the next outbreak of violence. There are parading white supremacists, two big columns of them going a different direction. They notice that one column has started to beat up some people. And I saw these young white men in their white shirts and their khaki pants running and practically slugging in the air. They were so ready to beat people up and throwing them to the ground, slugging them and kicking them. So that church also goes into lockdown to keep people safe. As the day progresses, I'm down at Emancipation Park, sort of opposite where Sahar was in the direct action, I'm in the street. And that's where big time violence breaks out. Every instance I saw the white supremacists commence the violence. Whether it was beating with a stick, whether it was kicking. They were also parading with their open arms. So right there, they're, they're presenting a message of intimidation. But we are there with a message of nonviolent, a message of love, and rejecting all of that. And then of course, Later in the day, after the park has been cleared, people are mowed down, many people are injured, named, one dead. So our day comes to an end at that point. And the, the note of poignancy was, for me, was to go back to the First Baptist Church on Main Street for Sunday services. And the sermon is given by Dr. Tracy Daniels. And she has a message. We don't change in any way from what we believe in. And she says, we are stronger than we look. So we have the same determination, even if for a very rough Amen. And one thing I I did leave with, <clears throat> and I did I did come away with, is that the police I believe really exposed um, to a whole other community their militarized tactics. I think because a lot of the young men that came who were angry from the white supremacist sect, you know. Um, were very, very, like as I said, they were very hurt, they were very angry, and they were obviously lashing out at something. Um, there were signs that said, Vanilla Isis, you know. Hmm. And, um, you know, when you correlate the issue, a lot of who, who gravitates to a community like that, whether it be the KKK or Nazism or Isis, um, it's people that are searching for an identity. It's people who may feel let down by their community or by their government. They may be unemployed. They may be searching for a way to get an education. Um, they may be looking to belong. You know, um, they're often recruited online. They're often given a stipend. You know, I'm not a trained sociologist, but I mean, there were a lot of correlations. 
you know, and and the police were not around for the first couple hours. I mean, we could not get arrested if we tried. You know, we were, you know, we could not. You know, you had clergy blocking the entrance. Hello, over here. I mean, there were no police to arrest anybody. You know, um, but when they, when the police finally had to step in and the National Guard had to come in, they did have to use their militarized tactics on a lot of the neo Nazis, um, including one of the organizers of the event. And I felt, I felt a lot of people feeling betrayed from the right wingers. We've been saying blue lives matter, you know, how could you be doing this to us? I mean, I had never seen um, white supremacists being beaten by clubs by the police before. Mm. You know, uh, even, even one of the organizers was, you know, put down on the concrete, you know, and even D David Duke, the head of the KKK came out and told Trump, don't forget who put you in office. You know, so I think the, the vulnerability, um, it, it, you know, was exposed, you know, and, uh, and I, I saw a lot of similarities between the marginalized populations I had seen in Standing Rock and in Ferguson and in other parts of the world, actually, with the communities that were lashing out. You know, and it shows a bigger problem within our nation and a bigger problem that we may be fe facing with regards to vulnerable youth and how they might be acting out with problems within our own society. And I do see a pattern, you know, and our country as a nation, if we don't address the root causes, which sadly I think come from our leadership, you know, um, because if our leadership betrays those that put him in office, um, we have a lot of angry, armed and angry young men. And that's probably what scares me the most, especially as a nonviolent activist from a faith-based perspective, you know. So may God guide us all. That's a question. Yeah. Yeah. So from a first amendment perspective where it's constitutional to speak hatefully, uh, constitutionally permissible to speak hatefully. I'm wondering how that, that perspective, in terms of approaching those people who were the progenitors of the violence, those white supremacists who really felt it was their right to do that, and from a constitutional perspective, it was. But I'm wondering how each of you feel about in terms of the engagement part of that. Like, what is the what is the conversational response? There are a lot of different ways to shout at one another and to project one's own truth as the truth, trying to squash other truth. But I'm wondering what 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 possibilities you witnessed for another kind of conversation based on the fact that they had the right to do what they did from a particular perspective. Um, I, I'm interested in your, in your reactions from that in terms of what happens going forward. Well, I think if I had to do it again, you know, if I had to do it again, I think I would have probably, you know, I'm not a trained pastor or a pastoral caregiver but I would have left an opportunity open for a listening circle and a talking circle because there were people on both sides that wanted to, to engage. And to me, that's a very holy thing, more than shutting down a conversation. Um, to me, that's un very un-Islamic because they were in accordance, they were acting in accordance with the law. They had a permit, you know, um, if I was going to shut down their conversation or block them, I would have been breaking the law. Hence, I would have gotten arrested, you know. Um, so I think as a faith-based organizing team, I probably would have tried my best to engage in dialogue. I'm not quite sure with the leaders because I think the leaders might have their own agenda. But I probably would have engaged or provided a circle with people who wanted to engage, you know, who were passionate enough to show up there and engage. I think there were sides on both parties that were willing, because I did hear, um, I did hear one community say, 
I might not agree with anything that the Black Lives Matter organization does, but I will defend their right to say whatever they want, you know? And one, somebody in that organization happened to be a young African-American man who was very, very strong on the constitutional principles. And then I was kind of saying, well, y'all have a lot more in common than you think, you know? And so I think I probably would have added that layer into it rather than singing. You know, although we did what we did because we appeased the situation and we calmed it down, you know, but in addition to, I think I would have provided that and probably more layers of that um, at, a, at, a, at a higher level, but also on a grassroots level. Um, because only then could we foster dialogue and discover through commonalities and work for change, especially if this administration does not keep its promises to the vulnerable that he did promise to. Um, because then they will definitely find things in common to work and to fight for. And only through collaboration can they mobilize for advocacy work. Um, I have a personal kind of idea I'm playing with. Um, yes, we have rights of free speech protected by the Constitution. And yes, you can get a permit to use a public park. And they got one. It was initially denied by the city of Charlottesville. And they were asked to move to another bigger park um, that could accommodate more people. Federal court on Friday afternoon ordered the city of Charlottesville to grant the supremacists their permit. But here's where I would add to it. We do not have to accept threats of violence in our community. And um, those people were so highly armed, at times they looked like a, a marching army unit. And they were all about intimidation. So. Would it not be possible, I'll back up for a second, it is possible for government to regulate the time, place, and manner of the issuance of permits. And would it not be possible to say under the manner piece, you're not going to come as an armed unit. You're going to come and exercise your rights of free speech, but you're not going to intimidate people with your big guns in our town when you're having a permit, because it's so easy for it to spill over into armed action. And let's see if we can go somewhere with manner regulation and still preserve our, our rights of free speech. No, that's a very, very valid point. Because you could, even theologically, you have the right to your own moral autonomy so long that it does not incite violence. And that is a very good point that you brought up. You know, say whatever you want, think whatever you want, do whatever you want, but if it incites violence, if it incites any form of aggression, then it is no longer holy. You know, and walking around with an AK-40 could very well incite violence. I mean, just the fact, just that fact. Um, and it was such an oxymoron because Virginia is an op has an open carry law. So perhaps they could have granted it with the condition of no firearms. Um, that is a very, very valid point. Very valid point. And then it goes back to the double standard. Had it been a group of 6,000 young men of color, or you know, African American, Latino, indigenous, or even 6,000 Muslims getting together for an Eid carnival, <laughs> but by the way, we're all gonna come and carry some sort of ammunition, then it would have been tanks, and riot gear, and SWAT gear, and maybe a drone or two, and inspection in and out. But because it was not people of color, and it was young Southern good old boys, and I, you know, I grew up in the South, so I can say that, uh, the police were not around for three hours. And it was the blanket immunity given to them that really, really um, is a, the, the crux of the problem. It really is the crux of the problem. And when the police finally made a decision to come in, it not only shocked and looked like a betrayal to those that were, that were allowed to come in, um, but it was too late. And it was too late for the people that were protesting, and it was really too late and a betrayal for the people that were allowed to come in. Um, so that has to be addressed, and it was very blatant at that moment.